We have been moved today as we have tried to relive the life of our precious Savior and tried to realize a little more of his struggles for us. And uh, just think of what is revealed here in Hebrews chapter 12, for example, how he endured such contradiction or opposition against himself from the great mass of rebellious individuals. And this is a challenge to us, in other words, since our precious Savior had these great struggles. Uh, And so this is written for our encouragement. Consider him that endured such contradiction or opposition of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. And so we're so grateful that dear Jesus did go through these struggles for us, And we never are to fail to realize this. And when we see more fully the future realm in heaven and we have our eyes open more fully to truth, this is going to be the great ovation, the fact that dear Jesus did go through the struggles of the world, took upon his sacred heart the sin of the world, and carried this heavy load through his life, and finally up to its great destination when in one great and grand and tragic climax with the whole world adjusted to it and, and uh, the atmosphere being charged with tensions. Think of the greatest climax that's ever happened in the whole history of the world. And here the Savior has his great monumental climax of realization of the sin of the world. And he sees this distorted picture that we've had up here where individuals are seeking themselves and defying God and not allowing God to have his rightful place. He's the creator. And what a picture it must have been to the Savior. So I view the dear Savior as as seeing this distorted picture because of man's resistance and his rebellion until it weighs his heart down and crushes his life out. And indeed we have the greatest moment in the world history when he ushers his last expression with a loud voice, we are told. And this is generally the climax of such a ruptured heart, they tell us. And those that have examined this situation find this to be another evidence that there was this great climactic rupture of the heart as it was broken by the weight of sin. And here is this great last expression involved of the tremendous realization of sorrow. And this was for us, that we might be partakers of the mercy and love of kindness of God. This, then, is the evaluation of what God thinks of man's rebellion. And how can anyone say that it's of little consequence in the great domain of God? We saw there were certain conditions we thought had to exist if these great problems were going to be solved. One of them was it had to be an exceedingly unlovely and awesome event. It indeed was that, was it not? Then it had to have great dignity and great and distinction because it was representing God and man being reconciled. No little event could conceivably solve such problems as this. And so our precious Savior manifested this dignity in an unthinkable way, did he not? And then we see there, there had to be this great publicity. Whatever Jesus was going to do, he had to do in the presence of the realization of the living world at that time. And indeed it was spread throughout the world as these thousands and thousands of people who came to this great day of atonement had the greatest observation they ever had, and they went back and told it. And indeed, we can be sure, even those who resisted God and refused to submit to God, nevertheless had a terrifying thing forced upon their minds. And it was impossible for anyone to speak lightly of such a tragedy which they beheld. Then we're so grateful that he did what he did for everyone and has no favorites whatsoever, no theological reservations whatsoever, 
But he gave himself for all the whole world in a glorious move of heart and love. And the conditions of entering in would have to be simple so the most elementary person could avail himself or herself of God's wonderful promises. There was simply a turn from the rebelliousness and a submission to God and this commitment of faith and then experiencing the love of God which would move people to continue in this tender love. We saw there were four major problems that had to be solved. We were in the process of examining the governmental problem. And we see that something tremendous had to be done, didn't it? The method of regulating moral character, as we have seen in moral conduct, was what we call consequences. If you study some of the older books, they use the word sanction. And so here we have the pursuit of life and the choice of life and the intensity of selfishness determined to have some gratification along a certain line and it builds up its temper of resistance and the regulated regulation of moral character and moral choice must be the realization that it makes a difference how we conduct ourselves now in forgiveness God proposes to eliminate the consequences as far as we are concerned who are forgiven now it becomes very obvious that God can't do this without some tremendous substituted measure, can he? So instead of the consequences, as far as we are concerned, uh, of uh, the pronouncement of eternal punishment with a total evaluation of guilt, and remember, even psychologists have researched that we forget practically nothing in our lives. And we can take any particular segment of our life and work at it for a period of time. And we'd be shocked how much we can remember. Now, if they've made this discovery, you can be sure that what God says is going to be true and that the unsaved will remember their actions against God. And therefore, we Christians, as a little parenthesis, are not to react and have vindictive justice to anyone. It's going to be bad enough that they will remember our face. They'll remember our love throughout eternity. And if they don't respond to the tender love of Christ as we try to bestow it upon them, and instead they react illy toward us, let us remember it is enough for them to fall under the responsibility of their conscience. Let's not try to retaliate. It's sufficient that they shall face this reality. And to be sure, they shall see our countenance in their memory. And if we have manifested a tender love to them, this they will realize the love that was manifested and they will see their reactions and lament forever all these movements of God and these movements of we Christians as we try to love and help people. So now if God is going to eliminate these consequences, some tremendous measure has to be brought into existence, doesn't it? And the, and the requirement is it must be at least as effective as the, as the fulfillment of the pronounced consequences would be. And so this is a requirement, isn't it? And must be the case. And so this is what we mean by the governmental situation. We saw there had to be a double application of this. There had to be an application in the minds of the unsaved. And they had to realize. We use the word public justice, which is a very common word in discussing the principles of the atonement. But uh, we seem to have not dwelt upon this. Uh, I have worked out this concept of public justice. And we say that public justice is the manifestation of due punishment in the presence of society so that all are impressed that crime cannot be entered into without appropriate personal consequences. Notice the features of this. There has to be a manifestation of punishment. It cannot be something convenient. It cannot be something uh, lenient. There has to be some kind of punishment that will bring realization. Then notice it has to be in the presence of society because it is society that is to be impressed. 
so that all are impressed that crime cannot be uh, entered into without appropriate personal consequences. And it is these consequences and their certainty that is the benefit of the discipline and consequences that have been pronounced. And so here was the question of public justice. And the Bible indicates the main purpose then of consequences is to cause a slowdown effect, a moral force if you please, to move upon the intensity of selfishness and slow it down and bring a realization as to what's going to happen. Then we saw that it had, there had to be a roadblock in our experience because God has been so unthinkably kind to us and we're liable to take advantage of Him and think that we can just keep right on doing what we did before. And when we get ready, good and ready, then we make another little turn, make a little turn for a while, then go back and do it like we did before. This seems to be what many professing Christians are doing. And they think there's no consequences whatsoever. Because God has been so kind that they think they can take advantage of Him. But if they have been made to realize the sufferings of Christ and what it has cost God to bring us to this happy place of forgiveness, indeed, this becomes a dynamic effect, does it not? And that uh, gives us an awe, an attitude of respect that we cannot trifle with the great love and kindness of God. And so we see the moral force of the sacred operations of God's substituted measure. We have in history, uh, you have this in, in several books, of the older books on the atonement. You have a story of Zeluca. He is king of the Lucretian. We think it is a true story. It is represented as such. And uh, you can find this in some of the older books over a hundred years old, who are referring to. And uh, the story here, it goes like this. Here's a Lucas, uh, appears to be a very noble and beneficial king. And he realizes that adultery is the destruction of his kingdom. So when you destroy the home, you destroy the kingdom. So he, pre he has a pronouncement that anyone who is guilty of this shall have both of his eyes plucked out. A very serious pronouncement, which is a measure of love, in that if we make the consequences serious enough, we will prevent society from getting involved, and it will bring about a benefit. Now who should be engaged, who should be found guilty of this but his son? Now you see, here are two controversial movements in this king's mind. He has a fatherly relation to his son. He thinks of the awful woe that shall happen to his son by losing his eyesight. And yet he's in the stress that if he omits his son, it will do two things. It will show that he is not a righteous ruler but he is subject to emotional favoritism. Then it will destroy the effect of the law because here are exceptions. So what is he going to do in this crisis situation? And as the story goes, he publicly plucked out one of his eyes and publicly plucked out one of his son's eyes. Now here is a substituted measure there's no calculated equivalent. A substituted measure has been entered into to perform the same function as the fulfillment of the penalty would have done. Now let us see that the power of this was even greater than the fulfillment of the penalty. Because if our ruler loves us enough and loves justice enough and loves his moral government enough. He must love us in an unthinkable way if he's willing to go through all this agonizing suffering on his part. It must mean he loves us unthinkably. And so you can see a remarkable respect would be created, 
a marvelous reverence for rules and regulations. It would testify that he believes that it is for people's good to follow this, to not violate the such a law as this. And he was willing to go to these extreme measures to find a way to exercise his love. And so we are suggesting, and this, these textbooks go on to show, that the, the atonement of Christ did not literally pay for the sins of anybody. It could not, as we see, because the precious Savior suffered in his humanity over a short period of time, whereas we are to suffer over our sin a certain quantity times an endless duration. So you've got a quantity times an infinity. And here is an immensity of, of guilt that has to be discharged. And no such conceivable technical substitution can be made. So we are representing the sacred atonement as a substituted measure to uphold the government in the enforcement of the rules. I just like to talk about my dear mother, but here's the greatest punishment I ever had. So if you will forbear for a moment, it is so beautifully illustrative of the concept of the atonement. I don't remember what I got involved in, but it's over 55 years ago, and this is the greatest punishment I ever remember receiving. I, I, I accepted that I, ha I was had some kind of punishment coming. I agreed to that. And I was bracing myself against it and getting ready for some kind of punishment, whatever that might be. And instead of this, dear mother went into the bedroom and got down before God and started to pray and cry for her boy. Now I said in my hardness of heart, this isn't going to bother me at all. Who cares if mother cries? Look what I'm getting away with. I'm not even going to get punished, I guess. That's all right. Doesn't bother me at all. Let dear mother cry. But we'll see in a minute who won the argument. <laughs> And, and there's this simmering down of my heart. It's melting. Just like you drop hot water on a cake of ice. Doesn't look like it would get very far. But you keep dropping this hot water. It'll soon melt the cake of ice, won't it? And so this boy is being moved. He's being broken. He, I can see this place yet. I went to the bedroom door to open it. And I'm crying and I'm broken here. And I want to get mother to stop praying and crying over me. And I, I try the door and it's locked. And here's a gush out of my heart. Why well, I can't even tell mother how I feel. And she keeps on, on crying and praying for me. So I, I was thoroughly whipped in this situation, you can be sure. Now here, my friends, there's nothing technical, nothing equivalent about this punishment that I remember. I had no consequences at all as far as any human con consequences were concerned. And so dear mother substituted her own brokenness of heart and prayer uh, instead of a punishment that I might have received. You see the remarkable principle that we are facing as we try to think of the atonement. The sufferings of Jesus as the Son of God and the Son of Man were substituted for the punishment of sinners when other conditions can be adjusted so God could forgive like we saw He wanted to but face these great problems. And so we can see how dynamic has been the result and how even those who want to defy God are nevertheless moved by the story. And how do you get so hardened in crime that you don't have some respect for the Bible and what it represents? You see the fact that even the low criminals have some kind of respect. And I read that they even want chaplains of some kind. And so they have a realization of the sacredness of the Bible and its story of the atonement. Now remember, we do not evaluate impressions by what people say. Because people try to talk out their impressions. But these deep impressions are there. And every single moral being has a realization as to what God has gone through.
to be able to forgive. And the unsaved had this great impact coming before their mind that if God would go to all this sorrow, all these, these emergencies, all this unthinkable struggle, if the great being of God would come to a pause, so to speak, and here would be the darkness over the whole earth, and here would be the evidences of this climax, if God would be involved in this way, it must be that he intends to fulfill the consequences he says. And my friends, we can be sure that if we can go on and live our careless life as we did before, we've never met the Savior. Because the Scripture is so emphatic upon this matter. It's impossible by how many times we have it told us. Uh, 1 John 3, uh, 4 to 10 is a very vivid, vivid passage. And in verse 9 we read something like this. Everyone who has come to be begotten out of from God, sin is not doing. Because, because his seed remaineth in him, and he's not able to be sinning. These are present tenses. Because out of from God, he has come to be begotten. And so when we have come to the Savior and realized his love for us, it is such a melting situation and we're so grateful for his love that we can't go out and live the way we did before. And then when we realize that the Savior doesn't save us by remote methods, he saves us by an invasion of our personality. He doesn't think it's a good thing to have as little as possible of him as possible. He thinks it's a good thing to have as much of his presence as possible. So he wants to come in and manifest himself to us. And when we've experienced this sorrow of Jesus that we might be forgiven, uh, God has a safeguard against our continuing the way we did before. So here's the solution to this great problem. And my, how we can feel the power of this solution. And how you can see the love of Christ as the great monumental restriction to any light-hearted pursuit and carelessness of life. There was the second great problem we saw. God and man have to know each other. And unless they can do this, God can't uh, reconcile himself and uh, allow himself to be manifested like he wants to, can he? Here was the second great problem. Man and God and man have to know each other if the reconciliation is going to take place. Of course, God has no need of enlightenment for us. So that part is all settled. But man has no concept practicing it at all as to the inner nature of the being of God. And so some tremendous measure has to be, be brought into existence to reveal to man what God is like. And we see some of the things that had to be conveyed. So we say the sacred advent and the atonement of Christ revealed the moral character of the Godhead and opened the door to full restoration and fellowship. Remember, Jesus said, This was eternal life, that they may be knowing thee by experience. And so here's the personal or God ignorance and confidence problem. Now, friendship is based upon this intimate knowledge, isn't it? On the part of the subjects of friendship. And so we have enumerated here some of the things that had to be developed in man's mind. The man had to know that God is love and is mercifully disposed towards sinners. And he's willing to forgive freely upon evidence of repentance. And so, dear Jesus, came to manifest this, did he not? And so he poured out his heart with his deep affection that man may know this wonderful, wonderful characteristic of God. Uh, what the little he did know about God, he realized something of the greatness of God we've seen. And he does have a guilty conscience and what he can't conceive of is that this great being of God can be interested in him personally. And that there can't be any personal love and any desire in the part of this great being of God to forgive him and to heal his guilt of conscience. Dear Jesus used various means, didn't he? 
He talked about the goodness of the God the Father, how he wants to bless man even though man is not treating him right. That, that Jesus indicated this wonderful development in his heart as he went over the earth. You have uh, in Romans uh, 5, 8, God is commending his love toward us, we read, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, this uh, verb, were yet sinners, uh, is a present uh, tense here, that we continue, continually being. In other words, here is a measure of God that uh, we have no desert to receive at all. Also the word, the verb commending is a present tense. God is commending his love toward us. Here we are as a human family with guilt of conscience. Here we have evidence of the great being of God. And God is commending his love toward us, indicating his desire to deal with us according to the way we do not deserve to be dealt with. Jesus gave uh, this picture of the king and two servants who had different debts. And uh, the king is represented as being moved with compassion, isn't he? And forgiving them, although they had nothing to pay their debts. So we have this wonderful thing that had to be revealed. Then man had to know that God is righteous also. And he cannot tolerate any kind of hypocrisy and insubordination. We can't come to God without an excavation of heart. How is that possible? We've covered up our own evaluation of ourselves, and we have to be discovered. We have to discover ourselves to ourselves, because we falsified our own position before God to such an extent. And so, dear Jesus, sat down uh, when He came and gave this great sermon, uh, chapters five to seven in Matthew, outlining the principles of the kingdom, and that this can be summarized. It seems. In uh, chapter 5, verse 20. And he compared this uh, to the Pharisees. They were a religious uh, fundamentalist, you might say, uh, in their concept. Uh, the Sadducees were the liberals, weren't they? Uh, but here were these uh, Pharisees who began with such a noble endeavor during the 400 silent years when no biblical revelation seemed to have taken place before the New Testament was uh, beginning to uh, be unfolded. And here we have the concept of Jesus. They conceived that religion was external. It, that religion consists in doing outward things rightly. And Jesus said, this is not the idea. Uh, he came to show that there has to be an internal revolution. That rather than studying the external conduct, we are to study the internal situation. There's two ways to live right or make an attempt to live right. In one area, you can concentrate on the outside manifestations, can't you? And this gets laborious. Or you can concentrate on the inside. And if you have nothing wrong in your inner life, then just let your life out. And you don't have to watch it. So you need to watch only one thing, your internal thoughts and your internal disposition. And Jesus was saying that, that his concept was not relating to the externals. But there had to be a penetration of the heart. He said, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, which was external. They even calculated the tithe, didn't they? And we're getting down to every single detail. And he says, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. In other words, he was showing that, that God looks on the heart and that nothing external would have any meaning in this reconciliation. So there had to be a revolution on the inner life. And there had to be a purification of the motive. A complete inner change. And so he developed this. He simplified the Ten Commandments as we've discussed. And brought them down under a twofold attitude. He said you are to have an attitude of love toward God. And if you have this you'll fulfill the first four commandments. And we are to have an attitude of love toward our fellow men. And if we do this, we fulfill the last six of the commandments. In other words, Jesus said that, that God is a God of righteousness and he has access to our personality and it's unthinkable to consider. 
a reconciliation to God who explores our personality if we're not willing to open up our personality. Obviously, this is simple, isn't it? Then man had to know something, how God felt concerning sin. He gets the idea because God is so patient that God uh, doesn't suffer very much because of sin. The remainder of this message is on side two. In other words, God is long-suffering and kind, as he's been everywhere manifested. And so man gets the idea that his rebellion isn't serious before God. And so Jesus had to manifest this. And of course, the most angry man that ever walked the earth was the Lord Jesus. And just, con just conceive how he felt in the temple when he came in the temple one time. And they were making this great temple area, an area profit. And they were trying to sell and make money and all this kind of thing. And they were abusing. And he conceived the sacredness of this temple. And as we said this morning, in Old Testament times, here was the dwelling place of God. Here was the Shekinah glory. Here were the manifestations of God to the tabernacle before the temple. God had talked to Moses. Here was the dwelling place of God. Jesus comes into this situation. He sees what's going on. Can you help uh, imagining how his anger and his righteousness just kindled? He saw this place as God's dwelling place. And God is dwelling here to bless man. And man doesn't want God's dwelling and wants to pervert the whole thing. So he had such a disposition of anger that people feared it and cleared out the whole place. You can see. Because they saw his disposition in such a manifestation and they realized exactly that he was right. And he embarrassed them and manifested this attitude. He says, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And can't you see his reactions manifesting God, how God felt concerning this matter of sin. You have another instance uh, when this uh, man with a withered hand it comes before Jesus as in Mark 3, 5, and 6. And uh, they are technical in their uh, concept that he shouldn't do any healing on the Sabbath day. And Jesus brings up the concept, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. He reasons them what they do with their animals, how to lead them to water and so forth. And they, they become technical. They're waiting there with viciousness, trying to find some reason to pick him apart. And can you imagine how he must have looked? The record says in verse 5, when he had looked round upon them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their heart, he said unto the man, Stretch forth thy hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored, whole as the other. And this rose indignation among the Pharisees and the Herodians, we read. And they counseled together, they had a meeting, how they could destroy him and get rid of him. So we see there had to be manifested not only love, but there had to be manifested righteousness, because reconciliation can't happen. Except we come to God's principles, which are absolutely right, aren't they? And no one can find anything in fault with them. And so we go on to other situations. One time they tried to trap him with the coin. And he says, here's a coin, Master. Is it right to give this to Caesar or not? And they're doing this to try to publicly embarrass him and get him in a problem where they can uh, enforce some law against him. And he answers them with such wisdom. Whose image is on this court? Oh, they say Caesar's. Well, you just go and give to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and give to God the things that are God. And this remarkable answer silenced his objections, did it not? So can't we see, dear Jesus, uh, being a contrasting personality, showing the tender love so deeply that he could cry and weep and pick up the, the needs of everyone that he came in contact with and healed them and put personalities together out of his great compassion. And yet he came with the truth to reveal what was right and that you could not come to God unless you're willing to have be excavated to the bottom of your personality because God had his, his contact in the center of our personality. Oh my, how man needed to know God. Then we had the descriptions of love among the Godhead. How beautiful and lovely. 
and how the Father sent the Son to be uh, the Savior and fellowship with Him in during His earthly sojourn, and how the Lord Jesus came to bear our burdens and suffer and die, and how the Holy Spirit uh, filled our precious Savior during His lifetime, and He went everywhere in the power of the Spirit uh, to uh, make the love and kindness of God know. Then man had to have respect for God. There had to be a fear, a, a reverence. And certainly what else could be? Think of the difference of dimensions here between a great being of God. How can man ever be reconciled to God unless he realizes the austere greatness of God and the proportions? Isn't pride a foolish thing when you think about it? The truth is that we have an immensity of God, isn't it? who is unthinkably greater than we can have any concept of. There has to be this reverence, this respect, of putting God where He should be and reverencing Him for who He is. And see, so you see, Jesus had to bring this about. And my, how He presented this. He said, uh, you are to, don't fear them that kill the, the body. That's all they can do, He said. But rather fear Him who has power to cast both soul and body in hell. I say to you, fear him, he said. And then Peter tells us about this. God is no respecter of persons. A wonderful statement. And since God is no respecter of persons, we are to have a reverence for him. And if you call on the Father, 1 Peter 1, 17, who without respect of persons, judged according to every man's work, past the time you're sojourning here in fear, or come to a respectful place before God. We, we discussed last night the beauty of God's love. And we said when we get down here where we belong, God lifts us up where we don't belong and allows us to address Him with the family name for Father. Can you imagine that? You can't hardly translate this, it seems, with proper respect. So this is the love of God, but we have to begin down here or we can never have this, because if we didn't begin down here, we take advantage of God, like so many are trying to do, and still profess to be Christian. Why, when we see the greatness and austere greatness of God, how can you live in some little old shallow position of pride? We see the great being of God, for He is, and this had to be. Remember always, God wants to bless man, and He is regulating the throttle of His blessing as much as man can tolerate. And if he sees us getting proud over his blessing, then he's got to shut off some of the blessing. Because he wants to bless us as much as he, as he can, depending upon our reactions to his blessing. But there's an absolute necessity of intelligence in all blessing, isn't there? And if we begin to think we're, we're, not to, we're almost as great as God, which must be the concept of pride, then we're losing the whole perspective, aren't we? And we cannot have a reconciliation to God. So here's the personal element that had to be revealed. Or man can't be blessed. Now remember as we shall spend three lectures on we hope. And trying to sum up all the wonderful things that God wants to do to us as human beings. After he forgives us. He wants to come upon us and, and to rework us in blessing. And, and fill us with his presence. And give us the joy unspeakable. And the buoyancy in our hearts. The pressure in our inner soul, praising Him and worshiping, glorifying His wonderful name. This is what He wants to do. But He can't do this unless we become intelligent. And when we become intelligent, we see God who He is, and we begin to see ourselves who we are. So we see that you couldn't have reconciliation without knowledge. And man has to know God in His great deity, in His great compassion. Think of such a love as this. My, when we see the great being of God being affectionately attached to us. And this relates to the next proposition. We have built up our superficial concept of ourselves, as we've said, to the point where we've lost our valuation. And just imagine how, how this evaluation has been lost. You have in the Old Testament a representative passage as to what has to happen. There conceivably be no salvation apart from humiliation before God. It can never be, of course. Our intelligence says it can never be. The gospel is not a plan to get people to heaven and have as little as possible to do with God here. The gospel is a plan to get people reconciled to God, which is their happy life. 
Jesus said, this is the life. The life is in the light. The more light, the better. The more light, the more happiness. The more light. And so we see a complete different concept that has often come to exist. Isaiah 66, 2, the last part. To this man will I look, even to him that is poor, and of a contrite spirit, and that trembleth at my word. So this is an absolute must that must come into our experience. We simply have to be brought down from our pinnacle of pride down to the place where we belong before God. Uh, we have 1 Peter 5, 4. That God resisted the proud, sets himself up against the proud. How could he do otherwise? God is not proud. He's representing himself as he is. You think he can bless us unless we want to represent ourselves as we are? My, how obvious and how ABC are these concepts. And so God resists the proud, we read, and giveth grace to the humble. Oh, how he wants to give grace. Wasn't it wonderful we saw those scriptures last night? How he wants to bless and give grace and throw out his life. And where's the end of this life? There is no end. And he's regulating his throttle as much as we can tolerate in our capacity and also in our submission, in our humility before God. He's regulating his love because he wants to flow as much as possible. In his great tender love, but he can't do this if we're going to get ourselves in a state of, of false evaluation. He can only do this in lie and truth, can he? Can't be anything else, of course, existing. And so humble yourself, therefore, in the mighty hand of God. that He may exalt you in due time. So here's the mighty hand of God, then. The sacred atonement being brought as the great moral force to bring us down where we belong. And once we build ourselves up, we cannot untie ourselves. We said it was like an animal playing with a whole ball of string and getting itself all tied up in utter confusion. And here we are, evaluated ourselves, falsified ourselves, and we have no concept of our real selves at all. And we can't untie the situation we've gotten into. So if God can't find a way to undo us and bring us down where we belong, then he can't lift us up where he wants us to be, can he? So certainly there has to be some kind of a dynamic force. And we learn this, that humility is more than voluntary willpower. The will must be subdued by a moral force or discipline. My, how many times we learn this from our children. And when they get into an unhappy, quarrelsome condition, and they're not happy at all, and everything is disturbing, and uh, there is competition, and there, is, there are reactions, and all of these things, and we parents see, well, they're just not happy. And what are we going to do about it? Uh, how we, we have to correct them. We have to bring them back to the point of happiness. How are we going to do this? Well, we try to be loving and put it off. And they say, yes, uh, we're going to be good, Mom and Daddy. Uh, we'll, we'll change. Uh, we'll love each other, they say. So they're saying some good things with their lips. But still the problems go on. And we try to have patience and love, hoping that it'll correct itself. But it doesn't seem to correct itself. And so we have to take some kind of measures to correct it. We had a very curious uh, method of punishing our children when they were small. It looked like it wouldn't do anything. We put two chairs about eight or ten feet apart. When our children got quarreling, we had them sit on the chairs and look at each other. This didn't look like that would hurt any. And they, they looked with hardness, of course, at first. And it was kind of a strange expression. Then they began to look at each other, and they thought, well, is this all mom and dad going to do? This isn't going to bother us much? And so on and so forth. We're getting away with something, and they would think they're, they're having advantage of us. But as they kept looking at each other, they realized that they were members of the same family. They began to get a perspective of their position. They did toward their parents and toward each other. And you could see their little hearts coming melting down. And after a short period of time, their little hearts would gush out. Mommy, Daddy, can we get off now? We'll have each other. 
And when we see that they meant business and said they could get off, and they ran into each other's arms and cried over each other and had the sweet movements of heart, you almost couldn't stand it without getting in another room and having some tears of your own. Because here was a real happiness of love. Then they went into all the little trinkets we used to have in our home. All kinds of little things. Everything went wonderful. They were happy with each other. It was a pleasure to live, a pleasure to play. The tensions were gone, you see. So they needed some kind of moral force to bring them down to the point where they were happy. Now we're children of God and there are similarities. And so we see that man can't untie himself. He says so. My friends, will we learn this principle? It's meaningless to have some person say, yes, I'm a, I'm a sinner, I'm guilty, I need a Savior without really gushing out his heart before God. This is meaningless. He's just talking with his lips. Or she's just talking with her lips. There has to be an exposure to some kind of moral force that will bring the souls down before the living God where God can bless them. And the only moral force that will ever do this is the realization of the sacred atonement of Christ which melts down the heart and brings us down to the point where we can see the love of God. We're going to see how this happens in our next lecture. So there has to be some kind of moral force of discipline to bring us down to the realization of our own dimensions and our own relationships. And apart from this force, we will never come to be humble and if we can't be humble, we can never be happy. We're always concerned with our own happiness. And this is so miserable because we're never sure we're getting the most out of life. And we're so sure that others are getting more than we are out of life. And so this is a restless condition, isn't it? So you have such a passage as Hebrews 12, 9. We've had fathers in our flesh, the passage says, which corrected us. We gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? And so man has to come to subjection to God or there cannot be any forgiveness and restoration and blessing. Now here's a very solemn thing to think about that we have in Philippians 2.10 every single knee shall bow. And God means just exactly what he's revealed. Every single knee shall bow, we read. And here you have the breadth of the description of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every single knee shall bow. We have our bowing in this life. Are we going to enter into heaven with our sins forgiven and never experience humiliation? Are we going to go into the presence of God without bowing our knees? Without realizing the judgment of our sins? So certainly, it is the cross of Christ and the sufferings of Christ which humbles us to the point where we now bow our knees here. Are we going to go to heaven without realizing our guilt? This leads us to the next subject, which we will further get into this detail. Of course, there's got to be this realization of guilt. And so the atonement of Christ is what humbles us and realizes our guilt and how is it wonderful that God's not like we are? As I have said, he could tell, he could talk to us like this. He says, now you rebelled against me these years. Now you show me that you will grind away for one month and, and see how terrible has been your rebellion. And when you realize your rebellion, then you come back to me and I'll try to see whether you realize it or not. God could do this, couldn't he? But God is so kind and loving that if he sees us sincere and really ready to humble ourselves and really ready to see him as he is 
and see ourselves as we are. He doesn't seem to work with us to see all the sins of our life that He could show us. But in mercy, He reconciles us. And then we go on our Christian life and begin to see various things. I wish say, Lord, now that wasn't right, was it? No. Forgive me, Lord. And then we see something else. That wasn't right, was it? No. Forgive me, Lord. So I think we Christians do more confessing after we're saved than we did being saved. Just because God is so good, you say. He's given the we are. But there has to be the sincerity of humility. And this is what God looks for and must insist upon, of course. There's going to be this reality. And so we have the fourth proposition, which we will spend considerable time upon. What we find in the Scripture that we have a part in this great transformation. We are saying now, as we have intimated, that salvation and regeneration is a moral change. A rearrangement of our personalities which we have so completely distorted. that we do not need any new equipment, it appears. Man is creating the image of God, he can't lose any of his equipment, or he's no longer a person. But we have utterly distorted and stressed and fatigued our whole equipment of personality. We had the illustration of a robber coming into a home and throwing everything into absolute chaos pulling out all the things that he could think about and coming into this awful, awful, disturbed situation. Now uh, we can't move in and live there and can't stay there. We have to set the work to put things back in order. Now we don't need any new equipment. We need to put it in order. And this is the concept we see in regeneration or the new birth or transformation. It is a marvelous operation of God in which we have a part and the Holy Spirit from beginning to end, as we've said, is leading us, enlightening us. And the Holy Spirit, as it were, brings us to a realization of the cross of Christ. He goes with us, but we must go with Him. It's not some little automatic thing. Some have supposed that The new birth is an entity which God automatically in some mysterious way comes in and implants it somewhere. If this would be the case, we wouldn't have to cooperate, would we? But the scripture absolutely comes forth and says that we do have to cooperate with this purifying process. The Holy Spirit leads us then and we react. And so we say that there has to be means then to do this. And this is the great means of the sacred atonement, which we never get away from in our whole life. We don't come to Christ in salvation and then leave Christ and find some other measure of spiritual experience. It is our precious Savior from beginning to end, isn't it? And so the Holy Spirit wants to purify our hearts, put things in order. My, how many beautiful scriptures come to us. You have uh, 1 Peter 1. And uh, verses 22 and 23, which has several different concepts, so beneficial to realize. We notice our agency here. Seeing ye have purified your souls. How would you do it? In obeying the truth. Well, well, who was the helper? Through the Spirit. What was the result? Unto unfeigned love of the brethren. What are we to do now? Continue to love each other fervently. What was this process? Being born again. And what was the source of it? Not out of corruptible sea, but the incorruptible, the word of God, or the gospel church, you see. And how enduring is this, which liveth and abideth forever? So we say that it's the sacred atonement of Christ, which becomes the means of this transformation. And through this, the Holy Spirit also can achieve our happy continuance in this relationship before God. 
So I pray that you will ponder these four great areas, it seems, that we need the dynamic moral force of the sacred atonement of Christ in this great means of reconciliation. We give you a whole page here, page 5 and section 6. And we go back to what we said in the beginning of this study of reconciliation. The Bible does not systematize all the reasons for the necessity of the awful event of the sufferings of Christ. The Bible does state, however, that in some vital sense, the sufferings of Christ from a broken heart over the world's sin during a brief duration of time unto death were substituted for the endless punishment of sinners as a measure of righteous forgiveness that God may be just and the justifier of sin when the conditions of sincere repentance and the committal of saving faith are exercised. In other words, the Bible makes the statement that it is absolutely imperative that this must be the case, otherwise salvation cannot take place. And so we have given you this whole page indicating what we have said, that no one is saved by any theory of the atonement, that we are saved when we allow ourselves to realize the sacredness of the atonement. Notice right in the middle of your page five, we have a statement like this. So we say, let it always be remembered that no one is saved because he professes belief in a particular theory of the atonement or because he's made a mental deduction that he is saved because he believes in a particular theory. Oh, my friends, I just get weak when I read something like this. Because we have this practice on every hand, trying to get people to believe that they are saved. I was supposed to have this as one of the important parts of a pastoral ministry. It was impressed upon us. There's all kinds of people on their way to heaven who don't know about it. And it is our duty as the servants of God to comfort those that are on their way to heaven and not not living in the happiness of it. In other words, they have assumed certain theories. They have assumed that their sins are literally paid for. And assuming this theory, then the next thing they're supposed to assume is that they are saved. Here's a theory, in other words. The sins are literally paid for. If they're paid for, of course, I can't be guilty. And conclusion, I'm on my way to heaven. My, oh my. My, how agonizing it is to ponder these things. Rather than this, we say, we are saved when we have allowed ourselves to be exposed. And how important this presence is in the illumination of the Holy Spirit to the gruesome fact that the Lord Jesus Christ has come into our world and has suffered the agony of death because of our sins, have thus been humbled under the guilt of our sins in repentance, and have made have committed ourselves wholly in faith to the Savior's sufferings as the only means of forgiveness. Here's the realization then, isn't it, of the sacred sufferings of Christ. And so you have such a statement as this in John 1, 12, as many as received him. Uh, and certainly to him is the important word here, isn't it? All that Christ is and did for us, may you receive him. To them he gave the right to become the children of God. And so we say when this is done in all intelligence and sincerity, they will receive the assurance and witness of the Holy Spirit that all our past sins have been forgiven as you have in Romans 8, 16, and will experience transformation of heart and life. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. All things have passed away, all things have become new. And Peter said that we will rejoice with joy unspeakable and full glory. And so here seems to be the great dynamic effect of the sacred atonement, and that we must enter into it by realization And as I have said, the New Testament church did not preach theories. They went out and declared the history, the teaching, the sacred fact of the sufferings of Christ. And anyone who would listen to it uh, had to be humbled. 
And when we are willing to see the necessity of it and be humbled under it, make our full commitment to it, here's the wonderful process of salvation which becomes a glorious reality. Heavenly Father, convey to each one of our minds some of these great principles. Help us to remember these pictures of truth. Lord, as we've spent these six lectures upon this greatest of all events, help us, Lord, to respond, we pray, with all our hearts in thanksgiving for thy tender love and thy compassion and thy desire to bless us. In Jesus' name with thanksgiving, amen.